Well, I think people are getting signed in and uh, we are pleased to have Jake here telling us about NASL2 Cassidy variant. Um, so I will let him take it away. All right. So thanks very much for the invitation. It's nice to be here, um, at least virtually. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some joint work with Nathan Dunfield that's been in progress now for quite a long time. Um, I think we really are coming very close to the end of it. We're down to writing down the examples. So hopefully it will really be done soon. Um, okay. So maybe let me just start by saying a few words about character varieties in general. Um, so the setup that we're going to consider is that we have some space Y um, and uh, some algebraic group, which is actually always going to be a subset of GL2C, um, subgroup of GL2C. And we consider all of the representations of pi 1 of Y into G um, that's the representation variety, modulo the relation that two representations are the same if they have the same character. So in other words, if the trace of rho applied to every element is the same as the trace of your other representation, rho pi, applied to that element. Okay, and now character varieties for three manifolds have been around for a long time, and in a number of rather different places. So since this is the gauge theory seminar, probably the setting that's most familiar to people is um, the SU2 character variety, which is intimately related to the Cassin invariant and then to various flavors of instanton floor homology, going back to Fleur and Donaldson and then Kronheimer and Rovka, and that's still a very active subject today. Um, in a almost completely different world, there are people who study the SL2C character variety. And this goes back to Thurston and the fact that um, PSL2C is the isometry group of hyperbolic three space. Um, so people like Culler and Shalin have used this to prove results about exceptional Dane fillings of hyperbolic manifolds. So the cyclic surgery theorem is a canonical example. And I, actually, I find it really interesting that in both sides of this picture, you have people who prove theorems about, uh, you know, lens space surgeries on knots in S3. And yet it's really quite difficult to get these, you know, to see these results in the same framework somehow. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is kind of in the middle of these two things, um, but it has, you know, I think its own interests. So I'm gonna talk about um, the SL2R character variety and on the one hand, this is related to things that are maybe interesting um, from the point of view of the SL2C character variety and people who study that, like real parabolic representations or real ideal points of the character variety. That's something that people in this world are interested in. Um, on the other hand, it, our other applications are to things like left orders in the L-space conjecture, which are more interested to people who study Fleur homology. And I should say, you know, one aspect of this subject that I find really interesting is the fact that there's also an interesting connection to cyborg witten theory um, through the work of Hades, um, who relates the SL2R character variety um, to the sort of two spinner cyborg witten equations. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Okay. Um, so since this is a gauge theory seminar, maybe I'll start by recalling some things about the SU2 character variety. Okay. And um, maybe one thing to note is that since two matrices in SU2 have the same trace, if and only if they're conjugate, the same is true for representations as well. So in this case, it's maybe a little bit easier to think about the character variety. Um, two representations have the same character if and only if they're conjugate. And so just to start with a really simple example, 
we could consider the case where um, our manifold is T, T2. So pi one is just Z2. It's generated by two elements, M and L. And um, so if I have a representation from Z2 into SU2, well, the images of M and L have to commute. So that means that they live inside a maximal torus inside this compact Lie group SU2. And of course, you know, maximal torus is just a circle subgroup in this case, right? And so since it's a compact Lie group, all the maximal tori are conjugate to each other. So I might as well, since I can conjugate, I might as well just choose my favorite maximal torus, which is the diagonal one, and assume that rho of mu looks like this, some parameter x here, and rho of l looks like this with some parameter y. Okay, and so then what does that mean for the character variety? Well, in order to specify a representation up to conjugation, I need to pick x and y. These give me elements, two elements in t. Um, but then I still need to divide out by the conjugation action that fixes my preferred maximal torus. That's exactly the action of the vial group, which in this case is just um, Z mod two. So this is just the action, the quotient of S1 times S1 by the obvious Z mod two action that sends X, Y to minus X minus Y. Okay, and that's, that's a well-known space. That's what's usually called the pillowcase orbifold. Um, so that's a orbifold S2 with four cone points of order two. And it looks like the kind of um, pillow that you'd find on your sofa. And the conventions I'll choose for my coordinates on the pillowcase is that the meridional holonomy, the X coordinate here is down on the X axis and the longitudinal holonomy here is on the vertical axis. Okay, so now the case that we're really interested in is when y is the complement of the knot in S3. Okay, and now we have an inclusion map on pi one um, from pi one of the boundary into pi one of y, okay, which induces the map I upper star going the upper way from the character variety of the knot complement to the character variety of the boundary torus. Okay, and so Pictorially, that's how I'll always think about these character varieties, is kind of sitting inside of the character variety of the boundary torus. Um, so maybe just to consider a simple example, we could take K to be the trefoil knot, okay? And then if I were to draw the image of the character variety inside the pillowcase, it would look like this, okay? So you can see there's kind of a horizontal part that I've colored blue down along the bottom, and then another more interesting part that I've colored red. Okay, and so what's going on here? Um, well, let's just point out a few general properties of character varieties, the SU2 character variety that are reflected in this example. So the first one is that I can always split up the character variety into two pieces consisting of the reducible representations those are all the representations that factor through H1 of my knot complement. Okay, and now H1 of my knot complement is always Z regardless of what the knot is. Okay, so this set of irreducible representations is always the same. It doesn't care what the knot is. It's always this horizontal arc at the bottom of the pillowcase where the holonomy along the longitude is zero. Um, okay, and then there's an interesting part. Everything else is the irreducibles. Okay, and here I've drawn the irreducible character variety in red. Um, and maybe one thing to note is, as shown here, the irreducible character variety looks like a curve. So in general, the expected dimension of the irreducible part is one. So this behaves as we'd expect, but of course that doesn't always have to be the case that the actual dimension is the same as the expected dimension. Okay. And now another interesting feature of the character variety that we should pay attention to is the fact that if I take the whole character variety, it's compact. Um, 
But if I just look at the irreducibles, that set is not compact. Okay. And in fact, the irreducibles limit to the reducibles at some points. Um, and the form of those points is governed by the Alexander polynomial of the knot. Okay, so in particular, if I have a point with coordinate x0 here on the reducible locus, if it's the limit of an irreducible, you know, a family of irreducibles, then it has to be a root of the Alexander polynomial in this sense that I've written here. Okay. Um, and again, you can see that for the trefoil knot, right? So the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil looks like t cubed minus one over t minus one. The roots are six roots of unity, and that's directly connected to the fact that um, the coordinates of these two endpoints here are at one sixth and five sixths. Okay, and so now let me say one last thing, um, which isn't generally true, it's quite special to the torus knots. Okay, the reason that um, this irreducible part is so nice and easy to draw is that um, the complement of the trefoil or any other torus knot is ciphered fibered. And so in fact, the ciphered fiber is a curve in the boundary. And if I have, it sits in the center of pi one of the knot complement. So if I have an irreducible representation, um, that representation has to send the ciphered fiber to a central element of SU2. So that's gotta be plus or minus so I. Those are the only central elements. And that says that the holonomy along the ciphered fiber is fixed. Okay, and that forces the character variety to lie on this curve, which is a line. Um, and of course the slope of the line is governed in this case by the fact that the slope of the ciphered fiber is p times q, which is six in this case. Okay. All right, so now we've seen a few things about the character variety. We can have a shot at the classical Cass and Lind invariant. Um, so what's the Cass and Lind invariant? This was defined by Lind in sort of analogy with Cassin's invariant for homology three spheres. Um, and so one way, uh, one way that you could roughly think about it is I take this vertical circle in the pillowcase here with coordinates theta, okay? And I count its intersection number um, with the irreducible part of my character variety. And I guess I should have said that you know, I can also naturally arrange that this character variety is oriented. Now, it's only an approximate definition, and we'll talk about some better definitions as we go along. Um, but one thing that you can see from this picture is that um, the value of the Cass and Lin invariant is going to be a function of this coordinate, horizontal coordinate theta, um, and it's going to jump for example, as we go from here to here, as we pass over roots of um, the uh, um, Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. Okay, and so for convenience, sometimes it's better to at least in our paper, we sometimes index, we often, we index this with another variable C, which is just the trace of the, these matrices. So C here is two cosine theta in these coordinates. Okay, and so now once you know that this invariant jumps at roots of the Alexander polynomial, um, you may be familiar with another uh, invariant which jumps at roots of the Alexander polynomial, um, like the Tristan Levine signature. And uh, so in fact, I think maybe this was first suggested by Danny Ruberman and then proved by Chris Harold and Hoisner and Kroll that uh, um, the Cass and Lin invariant is really just another way of telling you the Tristan Levine signature function of your knot. Um, 
and you know, maybe with a factor of a half thrown in here or minus a half. Uh, and if you don't know what the Tristan Levine signature function is, you can think about its value at one half on this chart. Um, and that's just the ordinary signature of the knot. Okay, so what, what this theorem is saying is that the Cass and Linn invariant isn't providing you with new information, but what it's telling you is it's telling you something interesting about the SU2 character variety in terms of something we already knew about. Um, so maybe let me just make a few more comments about this. So first about this quoted definition, maybe, you know, maybe a better way to think about this definition is to say that the Cass and Linn invariant is a count of irreducible representations, you know, points in the, you know, elements of the character variety that send the trace of rho of mu to this fixed number C. Um, that's maybe a slightly more honest way of putting it. Um, you still have to decide what you mean by a sign count, but that's really what it is. Okay. And uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that um, if I were to look at the vertical side of the pillowcase here, or equivalently this side over here, they're related by a symmetry, um, the irreducible character variety never intersects these lines. And that's because if, you know, this would correspond, for example, to having trace of rho of mu equal to two. And so I give you an element in SU2 whose trace is two, that element is the identity, okay? So that means that actually a representation like this factors through pi one of S3, okay? So it's the trivial representation. Okay, um, so now what we're really interested in here, actually maybe I should stop for a moment and ask if there are any questions before I go on. Um, okay. All right, so let me keep going then. Uh, so what we're really interested in here is not when G is SU2, but when G is SL2R. Um, and one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to point out some ways in which this situation is different from the more familiar SU2 situation, okay? And the first way that it's different is that inside of SL2R, there are different types of one parameter subgroups that aren't conjugate to each other. Unlike in the compactly group where all one parameter subgroups are conjugate. Okay, so in fact, if you think about it just a little, it turns out that there are three different conjugacy classes of one parameter subgroups. Okay, so they're the elliptic one parameter subgroups. Okay, and here the trace is always, um, between minus two and two, okay? Um, there are parabolic subgroups that look like this, where the trace along the meridian is always equal to plus or minus two. And then there are the hyperbolic subgroups um, where they can be diagonalized inside of SL2R. And here the trace is always greater than or equal to two in absolute value. Okay. And so what this means is that um, if I think, for example, about the character variety of the torus, I'm gonna have sort of several different possibilities. It's still the case that um, any representation, both mu and lambda have to land in the same one parameter subgroup, but that one parameter subgroup could be an elliptic one or a parabolic one or a hyperbolic one. And I'll get different parts of the character variety in each case, okay? And so for example, the overall picture that I get is that the elliptic part of the character variety, okay, that's where mu and lambda end up in an elliptic subgroup is again a pillowcase. And in fact, it's conjugate inside of SL2C to the pillowcase that we saw for SU2. Um, but then there's also um, 
a hyperbolic part of the character I, which is these four ears here, and they're joined together um, by the parabolic part, which is these four singular points. Okay. Okay. So that's a picture of the SL2R character variety of the torus. Now we could look at the image of the SL2R character variety of the trefoil knot inside of it. Okay, and it turns out that what it looks like is this. Again, since the trefoil is ciphered fibered, um, this variety lies on a line, same as before. Expected dimension of the irreducible part is one. Um, and again, it limits to the reducibles at these same points that are governed by roots of the Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. Okay. Um, so again, we could try to define a sort of Cass and Linn invariant for the SL2R character variety. Um, just for example, by counting intersections with these same vertical circles in the pillowcase, like this green circle here. And again, of course, you have to figure out how to make that statement precise. Okay. Um, but maybe let's notice what happens here. What we see is, for example, that in this interval and this interval, um, the SL2R Cass and Linn invariant will be one, let's say, um, whereas here in this interval, it'll be zero. Okay. And it's very interesting to notice if you superimpose both the SU2 and the SL2R character varieties in the same picture, okay, that, um, you know, they very neatly match up. And if I take sort of the total, the intersection number with the whole thing here, it's always one, regardless of what vary, what value of this parameter C that I chose, right? So if I chose a different C, I'd still get one here. Okay. So we'll return to that point in just a minute, but let me make a remark on the second difference with the SU2 character variety that it's good to keep in mind, okay, which is that unlike SU2, SL2R is not a compact group. Um, and that means actually that there are some potential compactness issues with the character variety. Um, and so, you know, part of the reason it's taken us so long to write this paper is thinking about what, you know, can and can't be said about these compactness issues. Um, but I think for the moment, I'm gonna take the lazy way out. And um, so use a fact which goes back to color and Shailen, um, which is that if K is small, okay, so that means that there are no closed in compressible surfaces in the knot complement, um, then actually th these compactness issues don't occur. Um, and we can actually define an invariant HSL2 of K, which counts points in the irreducible SL2 character variety where the trace of rho of the meridian is my fixed value C. Okay. And then the main theorem that we prove, and I'll explain in a few slides um, why you might be interested in this theorem, is that assuming that K is small, so this makes sense, then actually there's a single number H of K um, such that this sum here is basically constant, right? The sum of the SU2 Cass and Linn invariant and the SL2R Cass and Linn invariant is always identically equal to this single integer H of K. Um, and the, the minor exception uh, is that, of course, you have to be a little bit careful about what you're defining at these points where um, the character variety limits to the reducibles, okay? And maybe a slightly better thing that you could say that um, applies in this case as well 
is that you could think about this invariant H of K is counting equivalence classes of representations of pi one of your three manifold simultaneously into the, well, the double cover of the isometry groups of all three classical two-dimensional geometries. Okay, so I can simul, you know, I'm simultaneously counting representations into here. This is just a fancy name for SU2. And the isometries of H2 are a fancy name for PSL2R. Okay, and then to get something that's constant for all C here, I should also be counting representations into this cover of the isometry group of the Euclidean plane. Okay. And another thing that it's good to think about is that um, when C equals two, that corresponds to the two vertical sides of the pillowcase that we talked about before, um, both of these sets are empty. Okay, so actually it's only these SL2R representations we're thinking about, about. So in that case, at C equals two, another way of thinking about this is that H of K is a count of real parabolic representations of my not complement into SL2R. And that's, uh, that's something that sort of people in the hyper, hyperbolic geometry character world are kind of interested in. Um, okay, so maybe let me ask now if there are any questions before I move on. Okay, great. Um, so, Maybe let me now just tell you a few basic facts about this invariant H. So remember, maybe just to go back for a second, you know, another way to think about what this theorem says, right, is that um, the information that's contained in HCSL2 really consists of this single integer H of K plus the Tristram Levine's signature. Um, that's that's what this theorem is saying. So Jake? Yep. Sorry, uh, can you go back, just back to that slide for just a second? Mm -hmm. So in that, um, so just comparing the two boxes that you've got there. Yes. Um, and then just say take C equals two. So does that say something or other about the, uh, yes, it says that there are, there are none of these representations into SU2 or the isometry group of E2 um, at C equals two. They're only PSL2R representations. Okay, so it's, it's that it's, yeah, okay. So the point just is that it's, 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 it, 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 it the, really divides into two pieces, this H of K, yeah. and one of them is empty in, in that for C equals yes, two. That's, that's just right. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, all right, now, now I get it, yeah. Okay, um, so on a, a naive first glance, um, H of K shares a lot of properties that might seem familiar from the signature and other signature-like invariants. Um, so for example, if I take the mirror knot, H of the mirror is minus H of K, um, that's pretty easy. If I take a connected sum, H is additive. Okay, now at, th at that point, you should probably object a little bit um, because I said, uh, you know, I defined H for small knots, right? And the, you know, the connected sum is not small. Um, it has this incompressible torus, has this torus in it. Um, and, you know, so the point is that this is one of these cases where the knot is not small and yet it's still possible to make sense of what H should be. And it is, once you made sense of it, it is additive. Okay. And uh, the third thing, um, which I think of, is kind of interesting actually, is that the mod two value of H is always determined by the signature. So this is maybe a teeny bit like the statement that the Cassin invariant of a homology sphere is always related to the Rockland invariant mod two, um, but it's probably less sophisticated than that. And um, you know, really actually where this comes from is the kind of symmetry, the Z mod two symmetry that you saw in the pictures of the character variety that I drew. Um, 
Okay, so let's talk about a few computations. So um, Well, if you just go around computing for the first few knots you find in the knot table, this invariant looks an awful lot like the signature. Okay, so it's given by minus a half the signature if the knot is small alternating, um, or if it's a small Montesinos knot. And in fact, you know, it's given by minus a half the signature for every knot for which we can make sense of it with less than or equal to 10 crossings, except maybe 10161, but actually it should be equal to minus a half the signature there as well. And it's just, I don't have a convenient proof of that fact, just a numerical calculation. Um, but on the other hand, if you take the torus knots, um, so H for a torus knot is always, for a positive torus knot, is always just equal to the genus of the torus knot. Um, so that's, uh, P minus one times Q minus one over two. And that's usually bigger than the signature. Not always, but for all but a fairly short list of exceptions. Um, so th this is a really interesting example where um, H is not the same as the signature. And in fact, more generally, we conjecture that if you give me a knot with a lens space surgery, um, torus knots or such knots, then H of K is always equal to half the number of roots of the Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. Um, oops. And so maybe by comparison, if you think a little bit about um, the characterization of the equivariant signature um, in terms of these roots, right? So the, the ordinary signature of the knot counts this set, but with some signs. Some of them will be positive and some of them will be negative. But H counts them all positively, or at least we think it counts them all positively for these knots with lens space surgeries. Um, okay, so, okay. yep, question? Uh, yeah, so do you have any two exam examples of two knots which are concordant and H are different? Uh, good question. Um, so I believe the answer is yes, but it's been a year or two since I thought about it. Actually, this is one of these examples that we need to write up before we're done. Um, so that, I mean, the issue, the issue why somehow this shouldn't, um, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that this is not a concordance invariant and that you can cook up some examples. Um, Yeah, but maybe uh, maybe let me not swear to that. We, we yeah, we, we thought about this at some point and rejected it as unpromising. Um, so I th I think that it's probably not the case that this is a concordance invariant. But since I haven't written down an example, let me not swear. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean you know it'd be great if you know I think it'd be much more interesting if it were a concordance invariant, but. I don't I suspect that it's not. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so now the next thing that I'd like to say is maybe the third, the third feature, the third point where SL2R differs from SU2 in an interesting way. Um, and that is that, it, you know, if I look at pi one of SL2R, that's the same as pi one of the maximal compact, which is just SO2, so that's Z, okay? Um, so SL2R has an interesting universal cover, which is again, a group. Um, unlike SU2 where, you know, pi one is trivial and there, you know, universal cover is just SU2 itself. Um, 
And maybe it's worth noting that, so if I give you a representation of pi one of y uh, into SL2R, I could ask, does it lift up to SL2 twiddle? Um, and the obstruction to lifting is exactly some kind of Euler class that lives in H upper two of pi one y. And that's a very classical fact about central extensions. Um, okay, so we, you know, it turns out also to be interesting, I think, to think about this universal cover for a variety of reasons that I'll try and discuss a little bit going forward. Um, but so let's, let's first just note that uh, if I look at um, the, um, what do I want to say? If I look at sort of the SL2 twiddle character variety, that's not really quite right because you don't have characters anymore. So you have to think about what exactly it is you're saying here, okay? Um, then it turns out to be an orbifold covering space of the SU2 character variety. Um, and in fact, you know, if you just look at the elliptic part, it's the universal orbifold cover, um, which is just R2. So here I've drawn a picture of the elliptic part. And uh, what are these dots here? Well, these dots are just all of the sort of pre-images of the parabolics. Um, okay, why, why am I interested in those? Well, if you remember um, going back to say this picture, um, what can happen in the SL2R character variety is that you can have an arc of elliptic representations that exits the elliptic part at a parabolic point and goes off into the hyperbolic part, as you see here. Um, right, and so that's kind of an interesting feature. Okay, so, Okay, so similarly, if we think about um, the um, SL2 twiddle, quote unquote, character variety uh, for our not complement, okay, that'll be a covering space of the regular SL2 character variety for the not, not complement. Um, and so the elliptic part of this is what's called the translation extension locus. And um, it was originally studied by Culler and Dunfield. Um, and I'll, I'll explain maybe in the next slide or two why they were interested in it. But I think it's, it's kind of a very interesting picture in of itself. Um, and so, yeah, in fact, how, you know, how, how I got interested in this business is basically looking at this paper, paper of Nathan and Marx, where they have they have tons of really interesting pictures of what this translation extension locus looks like for not complements in S three and also for more general three manifolds. Really, really interesting paper. Um, and so here I've drawn a picture of the translation extension locus for the trefoil knot. Um, and you can see it's just the picture we saw before. There's this arc, and here's where it's exiting the parabolic and going off into the hyperbolic locus. Um, and as you can tell, the, the picture's, picture's invariant under the action of sort of translation by the uh, meridian in this direction. Translation by the longitude, really. Okay. Um, okay. And so the fact that we have this cover lets us do something kind of interesting, which is that we can define a sort of refined invariant um, where we count uh, not just 
kind of parabolic representations, okay? But the height in this picture at which they exit, okay? Um, so for example, if I had uh, the two five torus knot, I could pretty easily see that a fundamental domain under the translation action for its um, translation extension locus looks like this. And you know, up to this symmetry, there are two arcs exiting at parabolics of height one and three. And so we count this as being um, uh, we count this as being, we count this as being uh, T plus T cubed call this H twiddle, okay? And uh, so in particular, since this is just kind of a refined count, so if I were to set T equal to one, I'd get back the invariant H of K. Um, kind of interesting fact about this degree of H twiddle is that it's um, always less than or equal to twice the genus of K minus one. Um, so that's really just the Milner-Wood inequality. So there's an upper bound on how high these get, which is actually an equality for the torus knots. Um, maybe let me make a definition here. So if I give you um, some polynomial, some Laurent polynomial, we'll say that it's good if all the coefficients are either zero or one. Okay, which it seems like a weird definition. Um, but it's a theorem of Oshvath and Zabo that if I give you a knot with a lens space surgery or indeed any L space surgery, then it, it, if I take the Turai of torsion of that knot, that's just the Alexander polynomial divided by one minus T and expanded out as a Laurent series, um, then the Turai of torsion is always good. So for example, if I were to look at this 2, 5 torus knot and compute its Turai of torsion, which is easy to do, I'd find that it looks like 1 plus t squared plus t to the fourth plus t to the fifth plus t to the sixth, and then so forth and so on forever. Um, and you'll notice actually that this t plus t cubed very neatly slots into the gap, the two gaps here between the terms in this Turai of torsion. Um, that, well, you know, I'd like to believe that that's not a coincidence. Uh, so in fact, the conjecture is that if I give you any knot um, with a lens space surgery, this sum here is always good. Um, and it's not always the case that it fills up all of the gaps. Um, turns out if you think about it, the, the number of gaps in the Turayev torsion here is exactly given by the genus of the knot. Um, whereas, remember, we sort of conjectured that this H for these knots was given by the sort of number of roots of the Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. Um, so that usually this doesn't fill up all of the gaps, but somehow in all of the examples we looked at, and Nathan and Mark computed quite a lot, this this at h twiddle of k miraculously lands in these gaps in the tri of torsion. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish I knew why. Uh, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and in particular, I'd like to point out that this whole picture is in many ways rather similar um, to the picture you'd get if you drew the image of the cyborg witten moduli space of the knot complement inside the cyborg witten moduli space of the boundary torus. Um, and, in, you know, in that setting, we know there's this, the theorem of Meng Taubes that tells us that the Alexander polynomial is contained in that information, right? In fact, it's almost equivalent to the kind of information that you get by counting things in here. Um, and, you know, maybe that's not a coincidence because of this theorem of Hades that says that actually these SL2R connections um, basically 
amount to solutions of a sort of refined ver or extended version of the cyber witten equation where we have two spinners instead of one. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to ask why this might be true, but I, I don't know why. Um, okay. What conjectures are for, uh, also conjectures for LS space nodes or on the- Right, okay, so that, that's a good question. So I, it's plausible that this might be true for L space knots, um, but it's more complex. The, the sort of experimental data that we have is less good. Um, so I, I wouldn't conjecture that in the same way that I would conjecture this. And maybe just to kind of illustrate what appears to happen sometimes for. Um, L space knots is that you might, for example, see uh, an arc of irreducibles going from a parabolic to a parabolic. Um, and, you know, you'd have to, you know, in the examples we looked at, it looks like, you know, if these cancel out and you count H, then you still get something that fits in these gaps. Um, but somehow you have, you have to look at each of these examples by hand rather than just looking at the program that Nathan and Mark wrote that traces these things going up from reducibles to these points here. Um, so I, I think that's plausible and there'd be some interesting, con interesting um, applications if that were true. But I, I, you know, I don't have, I don't think the evidence for it is nearly as good as the evidence that there's something going on with these lens space knots. Um, but that's, that's, that's a very good question. How about the other conjecture? Um, for the other conjecture, I would say it's about the same. Um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, somehow we've got, we've got a lot of computations in some sense for these lens space knots and fewer for general L space knots. So I, I feel, you know, less happy say, you know, might be true, but I feel less happy saying about that, saying that about general L space knots. Okay, thank you. Jake, Jake, in the cases that it doesn't fill up the rest of the polynomial, is that, are those cases small? Some of those cases small? Um, oh yeah, I think lots of those cases are small. Uh, uh -huh. um, I mean, you know, so uh, again, the. It, the fact that it doesn't fill up the rest of the polynomial is actually generic behavior. Um, so in fact, a, a theorem that you can prove is that uh, actually the, you know, this kind of maximal gap in the torsion is always at height 2g minus one um, for say an L space knot. But on the other hand, you can prove that there are never any sort of parabolics at height 2g minus one in any fibered knot complement. Um, sorry, fibered hyperbolic knot complement. So that, you know, there's always, there's always going to be some gaps in, in a hyperbolic knot, basically. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now let me discuss a few quick applications. So the original question that we were answer, interested in and what Mark and Nathan were thinking about was um, using SL2 twiddle representations uh, to give left orders on manifolds obtained by the knot complement. So maybe just a quick definition, we'll say group G is left orderable if there's a total order on G with a property that if X is less than Y, then GX is always less than GY, regardless of what little g is. Okay, and so a good first example to think about is that if G is a finite group, then it's not LO, um, with a possible exception of the trivial group where, you know, people tend to define the trivial group as being LO um, for reasons related. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know the proof of that is easy, right? So if I give you some element of my finite group that's not equal to one, then let's say it's X, 
Well, x has to be bigger than or less than one. Say it's bigger than one. Um, well, then just by multiplying, I see that x is less than x squared. And by multiplying this inequality, I see that um, x squared is less than x cubed. And I get all the way up to x to the order of g, um, which is, uh, of course, 1. And that's a contradiction. Right, so you see, in fact, a you know, left orderable group can't even, can't have any elements of finite order in it, other than the identity. Um, okay. And so it's a theorem of Boyer, Ralston, and Wiest, Wiest that if I give you a prime three manifold, it's really a theorem about three manifolds with a non trivial homomorphism to SL2 twiddle, then pi one of y is LO. Um, and so in particular, you can use that to prove that if I take the n-fold cyclic branch cover of my knot, and if the equivariant signature, if the Tristram-Levine signature is non-constant, then all large branch double covers are left orderable. Okay? And so there's a conjecture of um, Boyer, Gordon and Watson that says that that should be the same as saying that all of, that none of these, you know, these spaces are not L spaces is what the conjecture says. And so I think that's an interesting question from the point of view of floor homology as to why this statement might be true in floor homology, since, you know, you can sort of see where the equivariant signature might show up in the instanton world, but it's less clear where it might come from in Hagar floor homology, for example. Um, and, you know, maybe just to point out that, the, you know, this kind of condition is really necessary. Um, so an example of Gordon and Lidman is that if I just take the figure eight knot, right, there, the equivariant signature is identically zero. There are no roots of the Alexander polynomial on the unit circle. And uh, every branch cover is an L space and none of them or LO. Um, okay, so the, a second sort of thing that you can prove using this invariant is the existence of, for example, real parabolic representations. Um, so for example, here's kind of an interesting story. Um, this is a conjecture of Riley's from the 70s that was proved by Cameron Gordon maybe five years ago. Um, so Riley, Riley is the the Riley who discovered that um, the figure eight knot had a complete hyperbolic structure on its complement. And the way that he did it was that, you know, he realized that he could study parabolic SL2C representations of two bridge knots and a way that was basically governed by a single variable polynomial. Um, and, you know, so using this polynomial, among other things, he observed that it looked like any time the signature, this is supposed to be not equal to zero, was non-zero, um, then it looked like there was a real parabolic representation, so parabolic representation into SL2R. Um, and so Cameron proved this theorem basically by looking at the polynomial that Riley wrote down. Um, but the, our theorem gives another way of thinking about it, uh, which is maybe a little more general. So actually the same statement is true if I have, for example, a small alternating knot or a small non tocinos knot with non-zero signature, um, then uh, it has a real parabolic representation. And that's really just because if H is non-zero, then we get a real parabolic representation, and we can compute H and see that it's the same as the signature for these knots. Um, and similarly, another kind of application along these lines is that if I give you a small knot where the signature is um, 2 mod 4, then I know that the PSL2C character variety has a real ideal point, um, which is a little bit you know, I think from the point of view of sort of people who think about 
PSL2C character varieties, you know, the fact that there's a connection with a signature is maybe a little bit surprising. Um, okay, so I guess I have about five minutes left. So I'd like to talk now a little bit about the actual definition and the proof of the theorem in the remaining five minutes. Um, so to do that, maybe let me just recall Lynn's original construction, which is in fact not so different from Kasson's original construction um, with the Kasson invariant. So we're gonna we're gonna start with a a plat diagram like this for our knot. And actually, Lynn used a braid diagram, but it doesn't make any difference. Um, and so that means that we can decompose the knot complement as the union of two handle bodies. Okay, there's the handle body that love, lies above this horizontal plane here. Let's call that H1. And then there's the handle body that lies below, that's H2. And they're glued together along this red thing here, which is a punctured sphere with two M punctures, where M is the braid index, you know, two M is the braid index of the plat. Okay. Um, all right, so now pi, we can certainly write down what pi one of the punctured sphere is, but it's gonna be convenient to think about it as being generated, not, a, not as a free group, but rather as a group where we have generators corresponding to each of these punctures and a single relation, which is the product. Okay. And then I can think about the representation variety of the free group generated by these SIs. Um, that's easy to understand. There are no relations. So all I need to do is keep track of where each of these SIs go. Um, and I'm imposing the condition that uh, the trace along each SI is C. Um, so that picks out a sphere, an S2 inside of my SU2 impossible maps. Um, and so this representation variety is just S2 to the 2M. Okay. Um, and to get the character variety, uh, I have to divide out by the conjugation action by SU2. Uh, most of the time that action is free, okay, but sometimes it's not. And where it's not is where um, all of the all of the generators here get sent to the same uh, axis in S2. Okay, so you could think about these elements as giving you a rotation by an angle theta where C is two cosine theta around this point in S2. Okay, and if they're all, you know, give you the same axis and this action is not free, there's an S1 stabilizer and we get singularities that are modeled on a cone on CP2M minus two. It's pretty easy to see. Um, now we could do the same kind of thing for pi one of S2M. And the way that you do that is just by thinking about the map from the representation variety of the free group to SU2 that takes a representation and looks at where it sends this relator. Um, and the representation variety of S2M is just the pre-image of the identity, of course. Okay, and this has somehow N, has, M is turned into N here. Um, this has dimension 4m. You check that this f is a regular map um, away from the reducibles. And so that you see that this looks like a submanifold of dimension 4m minus three. Um, and then again, you have to divide out by conjugation. So the net result is that we get a manifold of dimension 4m minus six. There's some singularities at the reducibles. You could describe those explicitly if you wanted to, but I won't here. Um, and so then I look at the image of the character variety of each of the handle bodies. That gives me a half dimensional subspace, which is really a Lagrangian. Um, and the real definition of this linen, Cass and Linen variant is that it's the intersection number of those two Lagrangians inside the non-compact manifold that I get by removing the reducibles from the character variety of S2M. Okay. And 
So how do we define R invariant? Well, it helps to notice that inside of the SL2C character variety, actually these two character varieties of S2M, the SL2 and the SU2 fit together. Um, they're the real part of the SL2C character variety and they touch at the reducibles. Okay, so actually what you do is you resolve that as singularities, you sort of blow up the singularities to produce a smooth manifold calligraphic XC of S2M and two Lagrangian submanifolds. Well, maybe I won't say that Lagrangian, but two submanifolds of half dimension LC um, that resolve these manifolds we had before. And then we just define um, the HC to be this total intersection number. Okay. And I'm over time, so I'm going to say one more thing and then finish. How, how, do, you, how do you prove that the, this total number doesn't depend on the C you pick? Um, well, basically, the point is that all of these moduli spaces for different values of C fit together into a single moduli space, which gives you a cobordism between calligraphic X for one value of C and calligraphic X for another, and similarly a cobordism between these L's for one value of C and one value of another. And then once you have that, it's just basically obvious that this, this quantity doesn't change. Okay, so I'm sorry for running over. I'm gonna stop now. Um, okay, I think we should thank Jake and we can then ask questions. Hey, John. <laughs> so, uh, Jake? Yep. Um, so going back to something, um, you, I think it was just kind of a small remark earlier. Uh, you talked about this congruence for the H, mm -hmm. H and, this, and I guess half the signature. Yeah, that's right. Like so it just, um, the way you described the proof of that was, I, I'm not even sure that I have a, a question in here, but it, more of a remark. That's very similar to the um, the proof that is given. So, I mean, the proof that you know Cassin's invariant has something to do with Rothman's invariant is rather indirect. I mean, it's just they satisfy the same surgery formula. But in the cyborg witten world, um, you can define a version of the Cassin invariant, which is you know count something. There's a correction term, which has sort of got a sort of signatures built into it, mm -hmm. and you know, and and then you make some argument with an involution that, that, that says that, the, uh, that that thing is the same as Rockland's invariant. In other words, you see a, a rather direct proof of that, which, oh. so I just, I, I, I don't know whether, so that just seemed like a curious that's coincidence. That's, that's uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, what, what paper is that in? Uh, well, that's in, uh, I guess that is in, um, well, there was two papers of, that sort of dis explored that, which was uh, Wayman Chen, Chen's uh, both PhD theses from mm -hmm. the same year, and Wayman Chen and Yuhan Lim, and that proof of, uh, I mean, that that's, uh, you know, I mean, in fact, Lim proves that the, I guess Wayman proves gives that method for proving that you get the Rockland invariant, and then. Actually, uh, Yuhan Lim proves in the end that, that you get the same thing as Cassin invariant. Um, but the, that, that, the proof that I just said, I mean, you have to be very careful because you have to, you know, make perturbations and everything. Yeah, that's right. And all that kind of um, scary stuff. So it just seems very, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's an interesting coincidence. And I, I don't really know what to make of it. And I don't know if you have any comments on that. I, yeah, I, I don't really have any comments, but the, it, it is interesting. Uh, um, uh, yeah. yeah, that's to think about. Uh, uh, Jake, what do these um, representation varieties look like at infinity? What are these representation varieties? So at infinity, you mean is... Uh, um, 
I mean, as the red curve and blue curve go up. Oh, I see. Okay. To the left. Sorry, let's. Um, I mean, in particular, in that cobordism argument, it needs to it need to make sure that there are no intersections that go off. To yeah, that's right, and that's what the small condition is doing for you. I, I see. Um, so it, this is just under the under the assumption that it's small. Or, yeah, that's but, right. Um, I see. So, and again, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'd love to see some concrete examples where. <laughs> where, where this fact fails. I mean, you know, yeah. my, my belief is probably, you know, based on the, you know, basically the only examples that I know that I can produce where we get this non-compactness is, for example, if I take um, a uh, satellite, um, like if I take a cable, for example, um, then, you know, then we do, do see some non-compactness where in some sense you have a point going off to infinity and you know the but the you know the sort of in, in that example the sort of non-compactness that you see maybe let me just summon up a new page um is of the variety where uh what do, what do i want to say um where the, you know, where there's sort of just something, it seems like there's just a single point missing mm -hmm. um, from the things you're counting rather than the invariant jumping as you go from one side to the other. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to understand better whether, um, you know, Sort of hope that if you know if you got the right thing to count at infinity, as it were, um, that you might just have an invariant that's kind of constant without that additional hypothesis, you know, without that small hypothesis or something like that. Um, but again, somehow I think we have not not very many examples to look at, so. If, you know, it might also be that I'm wrong and that, you know, you can find some non-small example where there's really, you know, a change in the invariant as you vary C. Um, and yeah, um, if, you, <laughs> if you know any examples like that, please tell me. Um, did, you, did you say that you can extend the definition of H to cables? Does, it, does this mean that? Um, yeah, so for cables, um, I don't think we're going to write that in this paper. But I think, you know, precisely, you know, because there is this non compactus issue at these points. Um, but, uh, you know, actually, I, I would believe, yeah, I believe that it does extend to cables. And that actually, if you take a cab cable, the formulas, very simple that it's basically just a sum, you know, that the H that you get is just a sum of the pattern in the companion, um, which is uh, somehow a much simpler formula than you'd see, for example, for the equivariant signature of a cable. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, so this is compatible with your conjectures about lens space surgery knots? I mean, some of the Bergen knots are um, cable. Yeah, so... Let's think about that statement. Um,
Yeah, so I think it was compatible with the two-strand cables that I thought about at some point, but I'm not sure about more generally. Um, yeah, that's a, that, that's a good question. Um, and in particular, the, you know, I think it's, you know, there's a naive thing that you might do. Um, yeah, it's less, less clear to me, for example, that the, the refined version of the conjecture. Yeah, that would sort of I think the you know I think the refined version of the conjecture might not be true for the most you know for the naive thing that you would do um, for these cables, um, but it yeah it was a little hard for me to decide if there was some other thing that you should be doing there, and uh, yeah so. Um, that's a, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I see. Thank you. It's certainly, uh, you know, all the, all the evidence that we have is from these hyperbolic knots that Nathan and Mark considered. Um, so, Can you go back to your last slide again? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to have to reawaken my iPad. Um, this slide. That that one. Um, yes. So you, I'm just trying to understand a little bit more what that picture. Have a, actually here. Why don't I go to the next slide uh, that I didn't uh, have time to talk about? Uh, right. Okay. So. Um, the, so, I mean, a good way to think about what's going on here uh, is really that um, SU2 and SL2R fit into a one parameter family of subgroups inside of SL2C. Um, and, uh, you know, for T positive, you know, for T positive, that one for, you know, all the elements in that family are conjugate to SU2. And for T negative, they're all conjugate um, to SL2R. Um, but they, they fit together into a nice continuous family. Um, and that's, that's somehow the key point, I think, in our construction. Um, and you know, so for example, you know, what the, what the blow up really is doing is here, you know, I'm replacing the reducibles with things that look like representations into this isometry group of E2. Um, and similarly here, um, I'm looking at representations of the knot group into the isometry of E group of E2. That's what these kind of blow up points look like. Um, but even more, you know, you know, even more down to earth level, really what I'm doing is I'm looking at, you know, so what, what does a representation of the free group look like? It looks like um, a bunch of points, you know, for example, in S2 or in, um, for SL2R, looks like a bunch of points in sort of H2 in the hy hyperboli model, uh, where I take both H2 and it's kind of mirror across the hyperboloid. Um, and th those points just give you the rotation axis um, for your element. And so what you do is, you know, you consider this family of surfaces 
interpolating between the sphere and the, you know, the hyperboloid. Um, and- I mean, one thing that, that must be clear once you think about it enough is that actually that red curve just passes through after you blow up. I mean, it, it's not that they're, they're the same number of points that enter the corner of the yeah, that's no, right. sorry. That 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 yes, that uh, that continuity is the analog of of the transition at the roots of the Alexander. Point yes, that's the, right. Yes, right, right. right, which is more clear. Yeah, I see. Um, so one, one thing. Uh, so the, does the I forgot which was F and which was S. Uh, S is the sphere with two M points. Um. Where, oh, S is, yeah, S is the punctured sphere and F is uh -huh. just the frequency. And um, the, that, the representation variety, f depending on C for two endpoints, it depends on C, right? Um, yes, it's absolutely. independent. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, well, maybe, you know, one thing, you know, one thing that's easy to say, right? So it's, it's relatively easy to see, for example, that, this resolution, all, all that this resolution is doing is it's blowing up the cone on CP 2M minus two and replacing it just with, you know, the pre-image of that point is literally yeah. just CP 2M minus two. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite a bit harder to construct this resolution, um, the resolution of the character variety of the fundamental group of the punctured sphere. Um, and the, the reason is, I mean, what would I say? It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the sort of total versus proper transform when you do a mm -hmm. blow up in algebraic geometry. So you could just kind of write down, you know, you could look at this thing, write down the equation that you'd expect it to satisfy. Um, but it turns out that that's, that, that equation actually is sort of, has a redundancy at, um, uh, you know, at this point where t equals zero. Um, so mm -hmm. if you just wrote down that equation, you'd be getting too much in this resolution. So instead you have to write down that equation and divide by a extra factor of T um, where T is this parameter that you're letting go to zero. Um, and then, uh, you know, you then have to analyze the resulting equation that you get and see, for example, that the thing you, you know, this thing really is smoothly cut out um, by that, that relation. And that, you know, that's somehow one of the trickier parts of what's going on.